All right. So welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be diving into the world of open source software and blockchain innovation. Um, so quickly, let's introduce everyone. First, we have Brian Carlson. Uh, he is the maintainer of Node Postgres. Uh, and we also are thrilled to have Max Howell. He's the re renowned creator of Homebrew. It's the popular package manager for Mac OS. Uh, currently, Max is the CEO of PackageX, and he is a key contributor to the T protocol, which aims to revolutionize how open so source software developers are actually rewarded. Um, so today, we're going to be exploring their journeys, the impact of both of their works, you know, their visions of the future of software development. Um, so we're really excited to get this going. So let's kind of dive into it, uh, guys. Really, I'll give you the stage. It's all yours. Why don't you give our listeners kind of a proper introduction and maybe a little peek into your lives. Off to you, Brian. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, Max, good to talk to you again. It's been a while. Um, yeah. I'm Brian. I've worked in open source for a long time and, and built applications as well. That's sort of my, my day job is sort of like application developer um, of various sorts. And then usually at nighttime or, or, you know, any side project time, work on open source. It, I've maintained particularly and mostly just the, a couple packages around using Postgres with Node.js um, for a long time now. So kind of comes and goes how much maintenance is required and how much time I have to give it and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I've been kind of part of the open source community for a while early-ish GitHub user, so on. Yeah. yeah, I was on GitHub like the first year, I think. Didn't understand Git at all. Like, yeah, yeah, same. I still am. It's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone just figures out workflow and doesn't yeah. really dive too much deeper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been on uh, open source 20 years. Well, that's how we're going to, like, professional development anyway so via open source like figuring out how to do just about every role there is when you're building things that's one of the beautiful things about working in open source i think is that you have to be the developer the documenter the marketer the evangelist the product manager everything comes on you so you learn a bit of everything yeah lots but of like customer you. support eventually too you know oh yeah that yeah a lot of that too like that's why I like hiring people who have done a lot of open source personally is oh you know, yeah they're gonna be able to wear any hat yeah i created homebrew back 15 years ago now and uh you know i've always been the kind of person who does open source and would rather be working on open source only uh which i find is what people in open source generally feel like i, I I don't know if it's the same for you, Brian, if you would be able to work on open source full time, would you? Probably. I do like working with teams, though. I'd say that's one thing that I miss sometimes is um, the project that I maintain has mostly been pretty small. Me and some, mm -hmm. there's a couple other com contributors that will kind of come and go um, to some extent. But yeah, that's that's the one thing I think I've missed a little bit. I'm kind of extroverted. So I like uh, yes. video calls. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, open source doesn't typically have many of those. Although, you know, I've worked in uh, several, several projects that have teams as such, although, you know, you only get to know them on GitHub. Mm -hmm. like I've worked with people on GitHub that I have no idea who they are, where they live, or very, <laughs> yeah. very little about them at all. Like, Same. Uh, all I know is their avatar is a dog and their username is something completely <laughs> yeah yeah even uh one of the folks that helps out a lot like they go by charmander and i don't i didn't know that was a pokemon thing for a while because i don't know i never <laughs> but uh mm. yeah even their emails like charmander at something.me so i was like i don't know who they are no idea but we've been in touch <laughs> online for a long time so it's kind of cool yeah yeah mm. open source can be like that for sure I, I kind of wish I'd always been anonymous, honestly. Uh, that would be a bit harder now if I was still anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I go into open source and I carry on. No, what were you going to say? I was going to say that I got on open source like 2003, I think. Discovered uh, 
KDE on Linux and got involved in that. Found, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of people who were trying to make something better than Windows was uh, why I really liked. Um, yeah. I wonder how much like Windows, because uh, when I first got out of school, I was working on Windows as well. I was doing .NET development. And it was especially for kind of like whatever the Web 2.0 um ajax powered websites dating myself a little bit it the stack that windows provided with dotnet was pretty cumbersome to use and so i was trying to break out of the windows sort of career path for a long time and that's how i started doing open source because i was like i have to do something that isn't windows in my spare time so i can apply for jobs <laughs> that you know if they're like hey you should learn you need to know like whatever rails or that was kind of the hot thing at that point so i started doing uh ruby but I've been doing tons of JavaScript stuff with these like single page web apps for a while. And so kind of as soon as node came out, I was like, oh, that's cool. I can write JavaScript and just run it in the command line. And like it, I mean, there were things before they had some stuff with the, the JVM and stuff, but it was kind of, I don't know, node just was like, it appealed to me. Not sure. I mean, it was nice. You could just clone it and compile it. Didn't have a lot of dependencies. And so, uh, yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. for me, it was like, trying to get out of windows and then it was just kind of because it was so early in the node development uh somewhat right place right time it just sort of like took off i think if if i had like written written like a web framework or something or you know like uh, at the time everybody was kind of do you remember sinatra the ruby on Rail, the ruby like web oh, yeah. micro framework everyone is kind of like cloning sinatra in their own yeah. platform if i had written like a sinatra clone or something i don't think i'd still be maintaining a, a large project but um since it was a database driver it's not very i don't know like hot software you know it's just like it just <laughs> needs to work and kind of be fast and not break or change that much and so that it became like a sort of steady background thing for me which has been cool it's opened a lot mm -hmm. of doors i would say you know mm -hmm. i think up until really recently the way to like fund open source, unless you were like a super massive project, there were a couple ways, right? But they were, they all took quite a bit of time and it was still kind of lucky if anything could get off the ground. But one thing that it has kind of consistently done is open doors. Like I've met people mm -hmm. who then asked me to contract and turn those have turned into jobs or startups and stuff like that. So I think that's been yeah, absolutely. a really big kind of like not directly monetized windfall from open source, but definitely something that um makes a lot of stuff easier i guess in the in the career world and it's just fun and you yeah. learn cool stuff i mean that's why i was doing it i was like this is cool and it's not windows yay <laughs> yeah there's something something about open source and developer tools that just really have always gone hand in hand and uh, i think that's a big part of why open source became so prevalent is that you know you couldn't depend on these companies to make the developer tools you needed and uh, i think we see that with the apple ecosystem quite a bit like developing for iPhone and Mac and stuff. Xcode is pretty good, but it would be way better if it was more open so people could customize it better to what we actually need it to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it makes perfect sense to me that, yeah, you got started that way. Like, I think a lot of us did. It's just you're searching around for the tool you need and it ends up being an open source tool like, a lot of the time. And then, you know, you start to get that itch to... Uh, build out the thing you need, which for some reason hasn't been provided yet. And then suddenly you become an open source maintainer the world depends upon. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, like some of us quit, but some of us, uh, strangely feel compelled to support all these people who maybe will give you five bucks here and there. <sighs> yeah, I think it's, you know, from my experience, um, a big kind of, I wouldn't, the biggest impact so far, I think, has been the the GitHub um, sponsor thing. It just, the because it's integrated in GitHub, and that's where most of your communication okay. and stuff happens, it's made it easier for me. I've found um, if I, I try and be uh, as polite and thorough as I can every time I respond, sometimes I'm very fast sometimes i'm on vacation for a week or something and so i don't get back to people but if it's a polite and thorough response to particularly like a 
someone who's asking on behalf of their company, sometimes they'll be like, Hey, through you, you know, a thank you donation, which is mm-hmm. pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, like I, I always felt bad asking for sponsorship, but uh, you, got, you kind of have to, it's the, it's the only system that exists right now to incentivize the kind of work that we do. But, uh, yeah. you know, typically I've always tried to be decent, uh, with my GitHub, I got a bad rep during the homebrew days because I was just overwhelmed by it and uh, didn't have time for people's feelings, which uh, you know wasn't, didn't didn't make me look good. Uh, so the hack news only remembers that side of me. <laughs> oh, right. I didn't ever. I never saw anything about that. I mean, I'm. I guess people have said things about like Linus. Um, you know, he could be abrasive at some points, probably for similar reasons. Mm-hmm. It's just like, I have a lot of stuff to do. That's the only person, you know, I try and stay out of the, I don't know, the programmer drama side of things if I can. Yeah. Definitely run into yeah, some well, abrasive people absolutely. on GitHub. But uh, yeah, like just uh, on Monday, it's Wednesday now, On I think it was Monday or Sunday, someone, you know, was like... Uh, pretty like hostile with some swear words about like why is the documentation still wrong on this issue after a year and i was like i think it's correct if you let me know where it's wrong i'm happy to fix it or the documentation's right here on github you could edit it just let me know what's wrong never heard anything back so <laughs> <laughs> don't know what to do there but just try yeah. and yeah just i just try and you know if i get upset i try and step away bit but mostly i mean 99 percent of the time it's been it's people are pretty awesome to work with and it's fun to do stuff and then um see people use it and kind of like man i did a thing and i put it out there and i don't know made a tiny tiny difference you know depending on what project you do it's kind of cool um yeah it's a good feeling certainly to have uh helped other people in this in this sector in this a lot of the reason that I ended up open sourcing things is like, let's see if this will be helpful to other people. Like, uh, didn't really expect anything from it, but yeah, much like you, certainly the open source I've done is open doors. Like, uh, I'd say the vast majority of jobs I had after homebrew were it was easy to get because they were like, You're the homebrew guy. Oh my god, here, have a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd say like one of the things about the current funding models for open source, again, I'm not sure of like, because Red Hat is sort of funded and they're open source, not sure. They're a company, right? So that's a totally different thing, but small projects. Um, It's, if you want to make kind of like, uh, from my experience, any sort of reasonable amount of money that you can at least buy groceries and stuff with, it's a pretty decent time commitment at this point. I'd say like, you know, you kind of, oh, it's kind of like working and like, let's say that you put full-time job numbers of hours into a project. I would estimate in general, even like a project that is like moderately sized, you're looking at maybe getting more than well, minimum wage is different in each country and state, but let's say, you know, maybe, a couple thousand dollars a month would be like, in my guesstimate, like a very optimistic amount of donations that you could bring in. But maybe I'm just really bad at like the hustle side of things. So I don't know. No, uh, the, the people I've spoken to, the, the highest uh, sponsorship I met was some guy who was making uh, about two grand a month. Which, uh, you know, if you're willing to move to a country where the cost of living is way cheaper, that can work. But, uh, you know, asking people to change their lifestyles dramatically just so they can work on open source full time is kind of unreasonable for sure. Yeah, Yeah, I've never received much in terms of sponsorship personally. Maybe if I'd uh, stuck with Homebrew longer, like the idea of sponsoring projects uh, really is not pretty recent still. Like at least with systems that make it easy for people to do it. Maybe if I'd start with homebrew, like till now, you know, right, I, I quit quite a bit of time ago now, at least eight years, and no, I just couldn't keep doing it. It's the truth of it. It was, uh, it was way too much. Way too yeah. Much do you find when you, I assume you still use it, like when you need to install stuff, do, when you go back to it, are you pleasantly surprised at the changes that have happened? Or, uh, no, not really. 
as like I've vocally said and uh, pissed off a lot of the current homebrew maintainers that you know I would have done X, Y, and Z. So, and I, it's so slow and stuff nowadays. Um, but you know, we did build package X, so I mostly use that now, which is you know um, is very fast uh, and useful. But uh, I think you know homebrew's just got this huge momentum kind of needs a rewrite in rust or something like that right uh, is, i think how it is but uh, the, some of the things they added for sure like were great like bottles was me that was mike mcquade i was still with the project at the time um but we would have i would have eventually added that even if i was still more active at the time because you know natural to want binaries rather than uh, source control the, the only reason it was using sources to compile everything was uh you know there wasn't easy ways to not not without money anyway to uh put binaries somewhere um and uh i wanted it to be more flexible that was always the initial goal like but as a developer you can go in and edit these formula to tune how you want it to work uh as a local thing i hope we originally didn't install right you just cloned it and then uh you could uh, maintain your own like local fork or private fork. Uh, but you know, like centralization is seemingly how humans like things to go. <laughs> so uh, it's just naturally drifted that way. But yeah, like uh, I still do use it for some things and uh, you know, it's, it, it is extremely stable, which is what I think the thing that uh, the current maintainers have really emphasize that was part of my doing for sure like i directed the you know the how the vibe the vibe of the project should be and i emphasized robustness and uh, not having like bugs but if there inevitably were bugs to make it so that it was easy for the user to figure out the solution themselves or fix it themselves and stuff like that like definitely continued it was part of the reason it was successful yeah that's so cool, what yeah. um what um made you in the, in the originally like create uh, your postgres uh, npm project um i got into using node when it was i was like on tinyclouds.com or something it was grindall's personal website and he put up a thing and i was like hey this is cool i forget where i heard about it probably probably hacker news um and i liked using postgres at the time and he had written a postgres postgres driver it was a it basically was i i'm trying to remember exactly what it was um but it was like one or two files and it was just some quick bindings to lib pq like the c query thing for postgres and it only did text queries so you didn't couldn't do like parameterized sql or anything like that and i've been building like uh full stack applications for a while and was like well you know i think parameterized sql is good um and i think he just done it as a demo or whatever but anyways i don't know i was just like okay well how else could i connect to postgres and there really wasn't a way and um i was just like i think it'd be really fun to figure this out and so i started reading the postgres they their docs are awesome and they documented the entire binary protocol i just started you know, oh, cool, I can open a socket with JavaScript, which never did that before because I was only working in the browser. So I open a socket to Postgres, sort of start dumping the binary out and like looking at the protocol and got it working and was like, cool. And then I just got really excited about it and kept building onto it. And then, um, yeah, so it was really, it was just like, there's no way to do this. I want to do this. And then I, I told some people in the, uh, the IRC channel at the time, like, hey, I did a, a client for Postgres. There's another guy. I think I think it was Felix. I'm gonna mess his last name up, Geffendorf or something. He was uh, he did the MySQL driver, and so I talked with him, and I was like, I did one like Postgres. I kind of modeled it off of yours, and then people started using it. And like I said, I think as people came to know it, as it sort of you know, luckily or whatever, got super popular. They'd just be like, how do I connect to Postgres? Oh, this seems to work. There's some documentation. It started as a GitHub, you know, readme file, and then eventually um, more robust documentation. But then it just sort of took off. And 
you know, every time I'd kind of mm-hmm. be like, oh, I wonder how many people installed it this week. Like, whoa, 100,000. That's crazy. You know, and then it just keeps going up. This is insane. Um, yeah. And the I think one of the huge, huh? The numbers get huge for sure. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is nuts. Um, I've been pretty um, adamant about backwards compatibility. I think again because I've worked in in startups and companies, and you're trying to you know build something that you can give value to customers with or whatever, and then you're using a package, and then it keeps upgrading major versions every six months, and you're like, well, we can't upgrade because like there's tons of breaking changes, but we've got all this stuff to ship, and I don't want to mess with this. So I've uh, been super pedantic about not breaking backwards compatibility as best as I can. Um, the API is a bit crufty at this point because I originally designed it. Uh, thankfully, I've gotten better at software over the past 14 years since I built the project. But some of the API choices probably wouldn't have made them today. But I'm still like not going to change mm. them if I cannot change them and they're not causing problems because it's the cost now. You know, it's like not my cost, but everyone else's cost is just like, I don't know. So that's sort of like yeah, well, what we uh we thank you for your dedication to robustness because uh, it is it is super important in open source and it pains me when uh people don't take it seriously uh but the truth is like if you're an open source project that doesn't care about that sort of thing then you're probably not going to become big because the dependency stack's just too freaking huge nowadays and yeah uh, you can't you can't be depending on stuff that doesn't care about that sort of thing. Yeah. I think it, it can be really frustrating as someone who like adopts an open source um, thing in their company. And then that project is like breaking major versions all the time. And then like, let's say a year and a half later, you haven't upgraded because you have stuff to do. And then you're trying to hire and people that you're hiring don't aren't familiar with the old stuff or like gross. I don't want to work on that. That's like old version that no one uses anymore. The docs go away. It's there's a lot of, uh, I guess, stuff. I'm sure the people who are doing it think about it, but I, I don't know. I've been on the other side so much that I'm just like, no, I hate that so much. So, yeah, I really try, <laughs> try not to make other people experience yeah. that if possible. Um, but yeah well we need we need more of that really like it's it's more common i think you know you've got react like increasing its major every year and uh you know often quite serious changes that are problematic yeah that was people. a big one that came to mind i mean i've i've used react for a long time and i like what they do but it's just like you see like a four-year-old react code base and it has classes and there's no functional components you're like man I feel like hiring for that code base would be difficult because people are going to be like, I used to do that and now I don't like it anymore. And it's not going to help my career going forward, which is hard Mm. for companies. But yeah, even there's like a, there's a performance improvement. There's a library that node Postgres uses to parse types and there's a bunch of performance improvements in there and I want to use it uh, because that's one of the slower parts of the, the library right now, actually. But also that library, they changed, um, dates to come out in the time zone of i forget the computer that you're using versus the time zone of the database it it was doing one and now it's doing the other and it's like i feel like that kind of breaking change is going to be super hard for people to deal with in code because they're like i have all these queries Mm -hmm. that are that have dates in them and now all my time zones in my app are different so yeah yeah that's that's pretty bad like they i understand they they wanted to improve it because they realized it was a mistake but then you got, you know, the QA required for every single app that needs that change. You, like everything involving your date will need to be tested thoroughly. And that's I know, and like so many everybody. dates and queries are like st- the queries are just a text block. You know, you can't even really be like, oh, I, I updated the types, and so you can like run the type checker and see that it broke. It's just like, no, yeah, all your queries are going to break now. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and like you know, there's no. Uh, there is no real consequences to open source libraries when they do that. So it's part of, part of the thing that I think the T protocol can help with is we're incentivizing maintenance, but you know, the, and with that becomes some obligations, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want your T rank to stay high, then uh, you need to make sure that the users are comfortable. Like right now, the only consequence is you get some 
angry people that you can quite reasonably tell to f off because yeah, you're not yeah. getting any uh incentive right yeah you're like it's so, free yeah, so go away if you don't like it mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh yeah like uh you've been part of the t-test net for the last few months um what well, you know initially drew you into what we're trying to do here at t um that's a good question i think uh, there are a few things one uh, making open source sustainable and fundable has been something that's been um, of interest to me for a long time i've tried a few different things i have a patreon because that used to be the thing and now there's github sponsors okay. and um I've, I've never thought oh this is going to replace having a full-time job but it it is nice to kind of be like hey i've worked on this for a long time it's you know, taking a lot of my time and it'd be cool to get some financial compensation for it. Um, so I think that's, that's a big factor there too. And then trying to approach it from a, from like a, a blockchain perspective, I think is really cool and interesting as well. It, it adds more robustness to it and it's a little bit less like, um, I don't know, in a, in a way like blockchain can be anonymous or whatever, but at least it's like auditable and traceable. Like a lot of, uh, sometimes I'll get a GitHub sponsored donation from GitHub username and I'm like, I don't know who that is. So I got to go trace them down and see if I can send them a thank you email and stuff. So I like that about it too. And I like the fact that you built stuff in to sort of incentivize, keep using it and to keep the token value actually increasing so that it, it's going because uh, there's a bunch to it actually you know as i as i think about it more there's a sort of um like i mentioned before with with uh open source now it's like okay if you want donations you got to grind all the time to keep getting them um mm -hmm. and then one of the things that we we talked about in the past but with the the t network is it's sort of like and i think you mentioned this before but it's like hey if, if you've done something and you kind of want to transfer it or step away or whatever at least the value that you've already created will like produce some value for you on the network as well which i think is is cool um yeah so those for some of the yeah well it's, it's good it. yeah it's good to hear because you know that's, that's our goal is to uh you know make it so yeah you don't have to grind like i did a patreon at one point as well and it took six months to get me to like half my rent in terms of just like begging people the whole time to incentivize, incentivize me and like yeah it was just a lot of work and um our, our whole system is hey you've already built something that's impressive here we've determined its impact and uh all you have to do is sign up and we'll reward you for that yeah, so we'll we'll see how it goes when we launch it properly in uh, the next few months. Uh, see if it does deliver on the promise. Let's, let's we'll see the plan. Um, yeah, so uh, I got some questions for me. Yeah. Um, how do you feel like things? Just, I mean, it's a pretty broad and general question, but two parts. Like, how do you feel it's been so far from your perspective as a developer on it and kind of running the the project or helping run the project in the company and then how's the adoption been like how have you how's the feedback been so i guess both your experience of like creating it and putting it out there and then your experience of getting other people to say like hey i like this or whatever yeah good questions um it's been a difficult couple of years i have to say because i didn't know much about crypto before starting this project i just saw the idea and its potential and i was like yeah, well let's see if we can uh attract attention to this get get some funding investment in and uh yeah like people were very excited so i was like oh great and then like figuring out how to do the crypto stuff it's been tricky a lot more to it than i thought uh it turns you know what you're generating like a micro economics sector essentially so you have to figure out how to make sure that that works and like what we're doing is pretty different there's not many projects like ours if any really so we had to be quite inventive so it's been very satisfying to see it all come together and uh now we're right at the uh, the finish line here and uh, ready to put it out there and see how it does so a bit nerve-wracking right now um adoption's been good though like in web3 projects uh we're very successful like over 1.5 million people have signed up at this point and 15,000 awesome. uh 
yeah, like very happy about it. Uh, more than 15,000 open source projects were onboarded as well. So we feel that, you know, the, we got good numbers and that suggests that uh, the community really believes in what we're doing, which is very rewarding. So uh, hopefully that will translate into a successful mainnet launch and, uh, you know, we'll deliver on the, the mission that we have, which is obviously to make open source sustainable. Yeah, no, I think that's that's awesome. With that uh, sort of, I mean, I don't know, feels critical massy size where you, you kind of need to get a network of a certain size to attract more people mm -hmm. to it. And like over a million people is a pretty big size, particularly because it's not like Twitter where you're going to have, you know, anyone's going to sign up. It's mostly a developer thing. So the, the, mm -hmm. whole, the whole population size is smaller. That's awesome. Um, one question I kind of had is, you know, I've been in the tool for a while and I like it and I've, I've kind of gone all through it. And I talked with uh, one of the designers for a while. We had kind of a design QA session. That was that was really cool. So I got to see kind of where it's going and it, it was uh, really neat to see. But I was wondering after the the main net launch, what what are some key roadmap things that you guys are targeting? Or is that secret still? Well, some of them are like we have some pretty big plans for the next four to five years. Like one of the things I like about this project is like the scope of how long we have planned ahead. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, you know, we're launching it from a non-profit entity in Switzerland, so uh, it will be um, there is no profit incentive for the entity that will run it. Uh, so they they don't have to think in shorter time scales. Uh, the, the purpose is just to make something that really will stand the test of time and exist as long as open source exists and be run uh, and governed by that open source community. So some of the plans we have for a few years ahead, we're not announcing yet, but like the whole point is obviously to you know uh, make the tokenomics continue to be uh, a success for all, all users who are involved. But like, you know, more after launch, we'll be working on the, the governance and DAO features that are important for these sort of projects. I say uh, I want it to be governed by the open source community. Um, we have like a couple of people running the Swiss Association and they have good familiarity with open source, but they're not like the open source maintainers that need this to work for them. And so making sure that the open source community has the governance power and you know not everybody else will be a key thing that we'll be doing after launch a few partnerships with some of the other players in the space but mostly we'll be concentrating that first year on just like onboarding as many open source projects as possible and making sure like the tokenomics that we've designed is continuing to work correctly have there been um other attempts in the web3 space at this sort of thing maybe um yeah, well, there, there is a few, like Gitcoin is obviously one of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. uh, they, But, uh, you know, their, their system still is, in my opinion, charity, right? Like, they're still charitably donating or, mm -hmm. you know, creating grants mostly. And uh, it, it doesn't help the entire space for a start. Like, that only can help, like, projects that manage to get the right kinds of attention. As we know, uh, there's a lot of projects deep in the stack that don't get much attention, and our system rewards them the amount that is uh, appropriate. Uh, there's been some, you know, crappy projects have turned up and like trawled GitHub, and then they just give you uh, some token, and they hope that that will, you know, create some demand. But like, uh, I think I joined one like three years ago that gave me fifty cents worth of. <laughs> token and uh yeah i'm still still holding it you never know of course <laughs> to the moon um yeah so another question i guess this might be a little bit in the weeds but i know for a while on testnet we were kind of looking at um sort of i guess uh, spam or exploit or sort of ways to game the system has that been more difficult to sort of i guess knock out than y'all thought or how's it been? Well, we hoped what we designed would be completely resistant to people gaming it, but it turned out if you create 30,000 NPM projects, then uh, you can game T rank a little. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're sorry to the NPM people for the spam. <laughs> 
Yeah, I got so, invited to a project that looked like spam recently. I don't know if it was because of T or what, but it was just like four generic, you know, like my repo name is just like car, apple, mm -hmm. fruit tree, guitar. Yep. Uh, so there was, was uh, some of that, but we put a spam filter in recently, which uh, is 99.9% .9 effective. So uh, we're, you know, that's become part of the algorithm now. Nice. There are plans to make it so that's not necessary, but we'll be working on that after launch, basically. I have one other question, like loosely related to that, um, is... So right now in, in the app, if you go and maybe I want to stake uh, another project and you can kind of, my initial sort of way to approach this would be sort by estimated yield, stake the ones that have the best because then I get more back. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm probably misinterpreting how one should approach that problem, but what are y'all thinking about in that regard? Because I feel like in a bit of a way, it's kind of like the current open source thing. Now where it's like the big projects get more eyes, more attention, more installs, more momentum. And so mm -hmm. it just sort of like, you know, concentrates that growth in particular places. Yeah, the, the design for it as it stands is the yield is higher for projects that have less stakers attached. So uh, that, that's, that's what's going on there. Um, there will be risk associated with staking at some point in the future. So you should pick projects that are going places that aren't going to necessarily have uh, vulnerabilities reported against them that could end up with you losing some of your stake. Obviously, uh, open source maintainers don't lose stake if they have vulnerabilities, but it's... Uh, because they get a little bit of the staking rewards themselves. You know, you're incentivized to try to get people to stake against it. And uh, yeah, the point of like making it so that projects that aren't as staked yet give higher yield is indeed to uh, try and encourage people to find, you know, new projects that are going places and then, you know, stake against those. Gotcha. To okay. To prevent the favorites being a thing. Yeah. That... That, I think, yeah, it's just misinterpreting that a little bit. So the more stakers you get, your sort of estimated yield is going to go down. So it's going to balance the playing field versus mm -hmm. just compounding the, the discrepancies or whatever the difference is. Cool. Um, yeah, I didn't have a ton of questions, like, super deep in the weeds. I was kind of curious, though. Um, this came up from when we just started talking today. But, you know, you said you kind of love working on open source and and you love coding. How much time do you get to continue to do that stuff now? Uh, right now, less than I'd like, but when the company was newer, that was my main job, right? I uh, try to delegate as much of the other CEO duties as possible while still making all the big decisions and concentrate on coding. But uh, yeah, my advice to anyone who likes coding is do not become CEO. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right, and that's a wrap. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Max, for sharing your valuable experiences um, and honestly, your innovative spirits with us, right? You know, to our listeners, we really thank you for tuning in. Appreciate you guys listening in. And remember, the future is being coded right now, you know, and why not be a part of it? Um, so don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more deep dives into the technology shaping our world. And until next time, keep pushing boundaries and stay curious. Thanks again. All right. Adios, y'all. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.